And now, with sound investing, here's Paul Merriman. Well, this is a really exciting podcast for me. I don't know if any of you noticed that I have changed my attire slightly. Uh, I pulled out a shirt that uh, a grandfather would probably use and when cuddling a new grandchild. And of course, I am obviously here to brag about my beautiful, by the way, nine pound grandchild, granddaughter, the first granddaughter in our family, which uh, in and of itself was remarkable. And, uh, and so that then, it, it, that, that makes me go to the table and sit and start to ponder what my wife and I are going to do for this grandchild in terms of some sort of a life-changing event. And uh, since she's too young, I'm speaking of the grandchild, too young to go traveling or to go shopping, uh, we've decided to do what we have done for all of the grandchildren, and that is to put away a little dough, a little money that, uh, uh, that would be used later in life. And, uh, and so today, uh, Daryl and I are, are going to uh, spend some time before we get into the Q&A, talking about the approach that, uh, that, that my wife and I are using. And of course, Daryl never fails me if, if I say, is there any way we could build a table around this? Of course, Daryl will build a table around it and, uh, and, and, and make the whole process uh, meaningful to people who might want to do something similar. Now, I'll tell you right now, this one is not going to be a long conversation because we have so many questions to get to. This is going to be a relatively brief discussion about this process. And then another time in the near future, Daryl and I are going to sit down and we're not, we're going to show you more than the little bit you're going to see today. We'll show you some other information that I, I really think you will find interesting if you're considering doing the same. Now, I want to mention right up front that you could do this literally with any amount of money. You could do it with a thousand dollars. I'm doing it with 10,000 because that is what I've done for each of the other uh, grandchildren. And so, uh, and in fact, my wife asked the question why there's no uh, ad adjustment for inflation, but I'm, I'm, I'm holding on to the idea that they should all get $10,000. But the idea is that it's not to do anything special right now. It's not to spoil them. It's not to, to do anything about their normal life for a long time. The idea is to put away some money for the future. And this time I've done it in a very different fashion than I have in the past. And, uh, and Daryl, would you do me a favor? Would you pull up uh, the, the table and the set of assumptions so that we can we can walk our listeners and our viewers uh, through this. And uh, we have to keep in mind that we do have listeners that will not be able to see that table, but uh, this here it is, fund for a granddaughter. By the way, I think this would probably work for a grandson as well, but- uh, Probably. <laughs> but this is, this is what we're working on right now. And, uh, and, and so, uh, the $10,000 is on the table. Walk us through a way to have this $10,000 be a wonderful source of, uh, of retirement for my, our granddaughter. Could you do that, Daryl? Sure. So Paul asked me to do this or take a look at this. I don't know. It was probably a couple of weeks ago now. And so we've, we've worked through it over the last couple of weeks. And I think, I think I finally got what he originally intended to do <laughs> models. So we start off with $10,000 that age zero, and it goes into a taxable investment account. And then that account grows at whatever rate it grows at this simulation of what we're going to talk about today assumes 12% per year. And that's before taxes. And then at uh, age 21, we chose, we chose 21 primarily because that gives 20 years for the account to grow and 
it'll be no great surprise that for the that that the taxable account is in small cap value. And so over over 20 uh -oh, year periods, uh -oh. Uh -oh. I didn't mean to let that out. Was that no, wrong? No, 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 no. Wait a minute now. Now remember we decided on the combination of the S and P five hundred and small cap yeah. value. Actually, what we really decided on was that it's going to earn twelve percent a year. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and and the reason why that is not not too out of line is because a fifty fifty account like that will will probably make twelve percent over twenty one years. Um, anyway, the Roth account is the same uh, in terms of returns. Contributions are made at, starting at age twenty one. They're made each year until it, until the granddaughter retires at 65 and then she takes five percent of the balance each start of each year uh to do with whatever she needs to do with it um to retire on to live on to do whatever and the plan ends then at age 95. and so, and i think it's may i just insert uh a comment here yeah. daryl and when we get together and we talk about this at, at more length we will talk about all the things that can go wrong. And the first one is it might not make 12% a year. That, yeah. that one would be actually easy that you could find a 20 year period. It does, the two of them don't compound at 12% uh, at a year. Uh, and, and of course, we also don't know what the, what the regulations, tax regulations on Roth IRAs will be in the future. So, you know, this, this is just, to get a sense of the impact of having money and time on your side. It's the same case we make for 21 year olds who are starting to work and earn money and trying to get them to save some, but go right ahead. Go right ahead, Daryl. So uh, there are some modeling assumptions that I had to make um, in this, uh, in setting up this uh, spreadsheet. And so the withdrawals are taken from the taxable account the first of each year, uh, over the course of the year, the taxable account will generate dividends. Um, we've chosen to consider them all as being taxable. So they're all ordinary dividends. It's all taxed at the dividend tax rate, whatever your current taxable, marginal taxable rate is. All withdrawals, in other words, the 8,000 a year for the Roth accounts, are considered to be 100% capital gains. You pay you pay taxes at the capital gains rate on on every penny of it. Those are both simplifying assumptions, and they're they're probably a little conservative. Um, the withdrawals to pay those taxes on the dividends and the capital gains are taken at the end of the year. Uh, in the Roth IRA, the contributions are made the first day of the year or first of the year when same same time as the withdrawals are are taken from the taxable account. The withdrawals for the retirement period are taken the first of the year, and the entire amount is taken at one time that first of the year. Great. So as you might expect, there are a lot of, lot of, <laughs> a lot of things to consider when you put this simulation together. So these are the, the scenario inputs. Um, one key thing here is Paul wanted to use an $8,000 contribution because uh, this first contribution isn't gonna happen for 20 years. And so by then uh, the IRA amount will likely grow above that. Uh, the model has the ability to inflate the Roth contribution also, and it has the ability to add Roth catch-up uh, contributions too, but we don't do that during this, this simulation we're going to show today. And the rest of these are pretty clear. For converting back to real numbers, we use an inflation rate of 3%, and then these are the tax rates. The capital gains is 15, the dividends make 2%, and the uh, ordinary tax rate, ordinary dividend tax rate is 24%. So what does this all look like then? So these are the numbers. <laughs> and by the way, so Darrell, I, I, I will have a, we'll have a uh, link in the notes uh, for this podcast that will take them to the, uh, the tables themselves that you're gonna be showing. Yeah, I think we'll have these charts. Yeah, a, a link to the charts, yeah. And the, and the tables, we can put the tables out there too. Great. So <clears throat> this is the spreadsheet, snapshot of the spreadsheet. And this is the early time. And this is primarily when, 
when the taxable account is growing. You know, starts with ten thousand dollars a year. You generate some div you generate some gains. Some of that is dividends, and then you pay some taxes on the dividends on that for the first twenty years. Then you end up at the be at age twenty one with about ninety nine thousand dollars. You take out eight thousand um, dollars to begin funding the Roth IRA. And then uh, that what the remaining generates some some dividends that you then pay taxes on at the end of the year, and you also take a withdrawal out to pay taxes, capital gains taxes, on the eight thousand you took out to fund the the IRA uh, at the beginning. Uh, can I just and insert, that continues. Insert yeah. something there, Daryl, and that is that uh, in theory, uh, my daughter and her husband could. Uh, pay all the taxes on behalf of the grandchild. But as this thing grows, the taxes become a, a more serious uh, uh, consideration because this, when you go out 65 years and you're, and you're, and you're, and you're growing, uh, certainly the, we don't have to worry about that in this amount of money that's in the, uh, in the Roth, but uh, we decided to model this uh, where in essence, the, the taxes will be paid out of the proceeds of the original $10,000 investment. Right. And you'll see how the taxes grow here in the next couple of charts. It's interesting that, this is just interesting aside, that the taxes remain pretty constant. They're about $1,800, $1,900 a year. So... so then if you look at the later years, as you begin to approach retirement, you, the the uh, IRA contributions continue. There's an op option to up them by the catch-up amount at age 50, but we don't do that here. You continue paying taxes on the withdrawals, pay taxes on the dividends, and making contributions to the Roth IRA to the point to where by the time she's ready to, to start taking withdrawals, the IRA has grown to almost $11 million. And you still have about 1.2 million left in the taxable account that will continue to grow. So uh, she's reached retirement now and her first withdrawal, these are nominal dollars, is about $540,000 in, in nominal 65, whatever 65 years from now is dollars. So in retirement, uh, let's move over to the Roth first here. Uh, we start talking uh, with about 10.8, 10.9, million dollars starts five hundred and forty thousand dollars, and that amount continues at five percent of the initial portfolio value for the year. She continues to draw draw out, and the final final withdrawal the last year is almost three point three million dollars nominal dollars, and the account balance at that point is is almost seventy million dollars. Meanwhile, the taxable account, which you've left alone over here, except for taking withdrawals to pay taxes on the dividends, has grown to $31 million at age 95. So in summary, I guess, now if we look at it here, you can see that the, um, the sum of the two ending account balances is, is 100, almost $101,000. 101 million. Uh, yeah. One million. Oh, hundred million dollars. Sorry, hundred one million dollars. It's only off by three orders of magnitude. <laughs> um, and the total distributions that the granddaughter took out over the that last thirty some odd years was forty six million dollars, nominal dollars again, for a total benefit of one hundred forty seven million dollars. Okay, so the daughter dies in twenty one seventeen. What's a loaf of bread going to cost in 2117? Well, nobody knows, right? But if we looked at the 3% annual inflation rate that we assume, and we go and we apply that to the withdrawals that she has taken during the, her retirement and the balances that are left at the end, you can see that she her first, her first withdrawal in terms of dollars for the year that she was born is almost $80,000. And may I give, I think this is important because some people think that, that what we are doing is going to ruin her life, that, that, that it, it isn't fair, that she should be made to work harder so she'll have enough. But $80,000, uh, 
um, is while it's a lot of money today uh, to retire with, it's not like it's unheard of that people live relatively normal lifestyles and have $80,000 a year in income to do it with. So, so uh, yeah, I'm, that's right. And it's it sort of, and, and, you know, she, you can live on $80,000 a year today. And, and uh, if you have, if you've worked and you have social security, that may add a few more tens of thousands of dollars onto that, maybe depending on the kind of job you had. And you may have had a 401k that you've contributed to. So you, you can, you can end up living an okay retirement, living a very good retirement, actually, um, at that point. Uh, the last withdrawal in terms of is almost two hundred thousand dollars when she's ninety-five, assuming that she lives that long. At the end of the point, the other thing sounds, is that she—that means like she'll have taken out about four million dollars during. Sorry, so it sounds like quite a party, doesn't it? Yeah, she'll have, she'll be okay, I think. Um, she would have taken out almost four million dollars and have a little over four million dollars left in her account uh, in today's dollars to pass on to her heirs. For a total benefit of eight million dollars, so for a ten thousand dollar investment by Gramps, uh, that's not too bad. Well, and and uh, it really is is obviously dependent upon a lot of things going right. Uh, it would be easy for parents and grandparents to make a list of all the things, all the reasons it won't work, but. But Chris, and thank you, Daryl. I think that's uh, that, that's great. That makes it very very clear uh, the steps that need to be taken. We'll t we'll talk in more depth when we get together, including showing you other tables that are based on eight percent and ten percent and and uh, uh, and and other considerations. But Chris, you're a thoughtful guy about these kind of things. You got lots of kids and and have plans for kids and grandkids. What are your thoughts when you when you see this? Well, it begs a question for me of, you know, is it better to set something like this up for your newborn grandchild? Or is it better to help her along the way? Or is it better to help her later? You know, and I, I think that that's a question that has both a financial part and a a parenting stewardship part. And so the, the financial part, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about pros and cons of different approaches. And I, I'm not sure, I, I think there's probably enough uncertainty in future tax law and investment returns and everything else that you could probably come up with uh, advantages for either side, giving giving at the beginning or giving in the middle or giving later. I, th I think that it's probably debatable on a financial level. I think in terms of the parenting concerns, though, um, those those are harder to answer, even even than the unanswerable financial side, because you don't know anything about the child. You don't know if this child is going to um, be inclined to <laughs> spend every every penny that they get access to whenever they get access to it. You don't know if they're going to be frugal and a saver. Um, I do really love the fact that in setting this up, you're, you're helping both your child and your grandchild know that they're loved, they're cared for, they're appreciated uh, from early in life, and that you're setting up an excuse to have some really good conversations along the way about how investing is an important part of becoming financially secure, um, and that you know, you're going to have an opportunity to talk about how these different asset classes performed and what it is to own equities. And of course, you're, you're not going to do that until they're at least two or three. Um, <laughs> so, so I, I, I really, I, kudos and props to you for doing it. Um, I, I wonder what holds people back, like was it why some people would do it and why some people wouldn't. But, you know, I touched on a few of the reasons and you did, too. You know, this whole concern about maybe spoiling the kid or not giving them the chance to to feel like they made it on their own from scratch. Right. So there's 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 some subtle pros and cons, but I don't think anybody's ever going to question whether you did this out of good intent and that it, I hope it has a very positive effect. 
Well, and there's, go ahead, Daryl. I'm sorry. There's, there's one other thing about this, and I don't know if we mentioned it or not, but in Paul's vision of this, the taxable account is set up in his daughter's name. Right. And so depending on what scenario, what life scenarios present themselves, the daughter has the ability to parent the granddaughter. Yes. With the money that's in the taxable account, because, you know, by the time the granddaughter is old enough, let's say older, um, you know, grandpa may not be as involved in her life anymore for any number of reasons. I don't mean to, I don't mean to put this on a downer, Paul, but. <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm you actually, I, I'm very excited. I'm 79. I have no idea how many years I have to live. I will unlikely, both my wife and I will leave some money to family. It may not be much, but there'll be some. And so uh, this is a, a piece that hopefully it, it will teach some lessons. For example, one of the reasons uh, why we are using a combination of the S&P 500 and small cap value, I would actually be pleased if by the time that this account has been open for 18 years, that it will have shown some good times and some bad. And sometimes the S&P 500 will do well while the small cap won't and, 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 and vice versa. And, and by the time that she finally knows about this account and starts putting the money away into that Roth IRA, she'll actually have been able to see real money doing real things, whether it's good or bad. And hopefully, and, and, and in a minute, I got a question for Chris that's come in. Um, I'm hoping that that combination of the S&P 500 and small cap value is something she could live with for the rest of her life. That's my hope. And so uh, if we start it that way from, from day one, I think there's some value in that, even though we all would believe that all small cap value would be better, right? In terms of return, anybody want to disagree with that? Probably history history says over 20 years, it would very likely be right, yeah. Well, thanks. I really appreciate you putting this together for uh, for the folks. Now, I've got a whole bunch of questions that have come in. And, and, and so uh, uh, the first one, and, and by chance, uh, if one of you have the uh, H1, um, uh, table available. I think that'll be a good thing to use. But this question is about the uh, being able to compare the different combinations of asset classes. And for people who don't know, we have eight beautiful portfolios. I'm only think I say that in the sense that in the past they've done well, and they expose you to different levels of risk. And then we also compare the returns of those eight combinations with the S&P 500. So the question is, uh, how do you know the best combination of asset classes in terms of risk and return? We know the one that made the most money. That part is obvious because it has the, the biggest compound rate of return, and the value of $10,000 over that 52 year period in the study uh, is, is the highest, but that may be because the one that got the highest return was really risky and might not be appropriate for people. But Chris, can you, and Daryl, can you put up the, uh, that, uh, that table, if you've got it, the, uh, yeah, I, I've got a, I've got a, a version of it here is prepared for a different conversation, but it'll work for this. So, okay, great. Uh, let me see if I can find it here. There we go. So this is the table H1 that shows the difference of the, I guess there are what, nine worldwide or nine, yeah, nine, uh, most of them have some part of worldwide in it. Uh, portfolios, the sound investing portfolios. 50-50 U.S. International. We'll talk about the green stuff in a minute, but this, this okay. is basically the performance. Um, so, Chris, could you spend a few minutes and give us some guidance as to how 
you would look at it in terms of trying to compare the risk and return of these different portfolios? Uh, sure, yeah. And uh, I, uh, I think it's going to be uh, a personalized thing that, that we'll come back to that in a minute. But at an objective level, uh, there are two measures of return per unit of risk that are fairly standard in the industry. Um, one is the Sharpe ratio and the other is the Sortino ratio, which Daryl has so conveniently calculated across the board here, not just for um, uh, the total duration of 70 to 21 that he's got represented, but also for the individual decades. Uh, I would generally look at the 70 to 21 if I'm trying to characterize, characterize a portfolio, just you know the full history because it tells us the most information. And uh, the difference between those two is that the uh, sharp ratio looks at the return per volatility, uh, per standard deviation, if, if you wanna get technical or use the technical term. Um, and the Sortino ratio looks at the return per uh, downside risk, which is the risk that most of us care more about. Um, most of us are, yeah. yeah, we're sensitive to the decline. I don't really care about upside volatility. If, if, uh, if the return is really varying a lot, but it's always positive, I'll be very happy <laughs> and most investors would be. So if we look across the chart here and we look at the Sortino ratio, which is that return per downside volatility, um, what we see is that the S&P 500 itself had this Sortino metric is 0.88. Um, a higher number is better, a lower number is worse. The worldwide ultimate buy and hold was 0.92. The worldwide four fund is almost exactly the same at 0.93. The uh, US four fund was a little bit higher at 1.02. Would that be repeated in the future? I don't know. Um, well, worldwide all value. See how it varies by the decades and it, they bounce all over the place. So. Exactly. So if you look at that much variability in the past, you probably wouldn't bank on that subtle difference being available right. in the future. I agree um, with that. So, you know, continuing across the uh, the worldwide all value was 0.92. The U.S. all value was 1.14. The worldwide all small cap value is 1.05 and the U.S. all small cap value is 1.23. And the US2 fund, that's the S&P 500 and small cap value was 1.03. So they're all reasonably high. Um, if you were to you know, compare to just the S&P 500 at 0.88, they're all better. And that's what we're looking for is a higher return per unit of risk. But coming back to the first comment I made about personalization, the way these numbers are calculated is by looking at every data point available. So if you if you have annual data, you do an annual calculation. If you have monthly data, you do a monthly calculation. If you have daily data, you do a daily calculation. If you can invest like Rip Van Winkle and look less often, you will see smaller drawdowns, statistically speaking, over the same period of time. So. Um, if you're willing to look away for five years or 10 years, you should care more about the historical compound and your annual rate of return and less about the volatility day to day. And so I think as a personal investor, the better your behavior in terms of being able to look away, uh, the more volatility you could tolerate. Uh, and the less important this return per unit of risk metric is. If you're going to look at it every day, the return per unit of risk metric could matter a lot. And you might actually be best served by like a Larry Swedro barbell of short term bonds and small cap value. A lot of short term bonds and a meaningful chunk of small cap value because that's going to have uh, a, uh, a very consistent delivery performance and, and quite a high Sartino ratio. Paul. You said if we if we can ignore the the downside and just think long term about the upside, and 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 so when I look at the sharp ratio, uh, which is about volatility on both the up and the downside, correct? Yes. Okay. So if if I don't care about the downside, it suggests that the the 
the, the, the two fund strategy that has a 0.67 sharp ratio, the one that my granddaughter is hopefully going to use is, is basically what? Tied with the US all value in terms of the- Yeah, I would look at that differently, Paul. All I right. would say that they're all basically, I would say they're all basically the same. There's not any okay. difference. There's not any meaningful difference, in my opinion, between 0.61 and 0.67. Yeah, the smallest one, the S&P 500 is, I agree with Daryl, it's a little bit lower, but I don't know that it's statistically significant. Remember what these measure is the return you get for the risk you take. And so what that means to me, since they're all about the same, what that means is you essentially get the return for the that you should expect for the risk that you take, no matter which one of these portfolios you invest in. Yeah, I like I like what Larry Swedro says uh, about these different asset classes, and that's that you would expect in an efficient market that as the return goes up, the risk goes up that the two go hand in hand. And, and that is generally what we see for individual assets as well as portfolios. And that's probably what that relatively narrow range is telling us is right. exactly what Daryl just said. Yeah. So, so tell me what I'm missing then, or tell me if this is just data mining, which, which as somebody who's been around market timing for 50 years knows how easy it is to data mine. Uh, when I look at the number of down years uh, and the average loss and the sum of all the losses, the S&P 500, the sum of all the losses for the period between 1970 and 2021 is 141.1 percent. And when I look at the two fund strategy, a strategy that made 12.7 instead of 11, the sum of the down years was 130.1. It actually had fewer losses, uh, lower losses than the S&P 500. So uh, is, is that actually more meaningful than the Sharpe ratio or the, or the uh, Sortino, uh, because that's that's the bad stuff that people had to deal with with that portfolio. But the upside was obviously much higher with the two fund strategy than the S and P five hundred. Is that just data mining because it only represents fifty two years of data? Yeah, I rather than looking at the sum of the down year losses. I think I would I would rather look at the number of down years and then look at the average down year loss. And I realize that you multiply them together and you get the sum, but but the number of down years is the number of times you're going to feel bad and the average down year loss is a measure of how bad you're going to feel when you do feel bad. So I think if you want to go back and look at the US 4 fund, it had 11 down years, the S&P 500 had 10, so it had one more down year, okay. But when it was down, it was what, three, two and a half percent or so uh, less down. So is that a good thing? Yeah, probably so. Yeah. Um, is it going to make a difference? Is anybody going to notice? Yeah, maybe. If you're if you're if you're really looking at the numbers, you might you might notice it. Um, so that that would be the downside of the equation. But I think that's partly reflected um, in the as Chris was mentioning in the in the compound annual growth rate. So we have not found the perfect easy solution, but but we have concluded that all of these uh, generally have a, a premium for the risk that you've taken. And that somehow you have to figure out by, by, by some quantitative, in some quantitative way, what was the more risky of the bunch. And maybe the answer is 52 years is not enough time. And Daryl, do you think by the end of next year, we will be able to see this kind of uh, an evaluation 
with U.S. asset classes only because we can go all the way back to 1928. Would that be the point uh, at which we might be able to dig over a long enough period of time that we might be able to conclude, yes, there is one that is better than the rest? Is that a good? I don't think you'll ever solve that argument. I don't remember who said it, but, you know, uh, somebody said, uh, you know, that you were looking at, at a thousand years worth of data and it didn't show anything. And, and I don't remember who this person was, but they said, well, you're not very patient then, are you? Oh, <laughs> and, and I think, you know, th that's the problem when you, when you start looking at statistical data is that, that you have to understand that you're only looking at a very small sample set of the entire possible universe of, of samples that you could have. And so, uh, this is the argument between empirical data and fundamental analysis, and um, there's a happy medium somewhere. But Paul, I, don't I want I want to go back to the uh, what I think is the heart of the question from the listener, and that's you know how do, I I can understand uh, the desire at a personal level to characterize the the risk and reward expectations of the strategy that you're pursuing. And I would say step one, figure out what risks are most important to you. Uh, you know, is it running out of money? Is it seeing a deep drawdown? Is it not tracking the market? Is it, you know, there's a lot of different ways risk shows up that can matter to an individual investor. And, and I think that that's really where this individual should start trying to answer the question is figuring out what matters most to them. And then they can go to the tables that Daryl's created. They can go to Portfolio Visualizer. They can go to a, a lot of different places and dive deep on the risk metric that matters most to them. Um, the one caveat there is like when you go to portfolio visualizer, be careful if you're testing um, assets that have a short return history, right. um, that's that's going to give you noisy data. But as long as you have, you know, long return history, like if you're testing the asset classes at portfolio visualizer, you can get some really good and interesting insights. So I, I, I think that it really is a personal question. Um, what is the highest return per unit of risk for one person won't be the highest return per unit of risk for someone else. Terrific. Okay, let's go on to the question from uh, Jim. Uh, he's got a, he's in his 40s. He's got $700,000 invested. Uh, by the way, I, I, I think this young fellow is also an engineer, as you two are by, by uh, um background and uh, he got convinced he should have bonds in his portfolio by an advisor uh, at his age and he's decided that you know, he doesn't want to have bonds in his portfolio at age 40 uh, and uh, and so now he's got to get out of the bonds and get into stocks and the question is how would you recommend and none of us are financial planners but we're, we have a lots of experience between us. Um, what would you recommend? Would you just get out of bonds and get into stocks if that's what he wants to be? Or would you dollar cost average in? This is an opportunity to do that uh, over, a, uh, over a reasonable period of time. The market has been reasonably low. Should that be part of the consideration? What say you, Chris? Uh, if he's comfortable just making the trade, uh, the if, if kind of an efficient market hypothesis would say, go ahead. Uh, and, uh, you know, you would, the, the higher return expectations are generally for stocks over bonds. And so, um, you know, the sooner you would make that change, the higher your return would be um, statistically and historically your mileage may vary. Nobody knows the future. If you're uncomfortable with that, you can dollar cost average in. Um, and, and then the other thing that's likely to creep in is some timing questions, right? Somebody's going to wonder about, well, you know, interest rates are likely to X in the near future. <laughs> um, you know, they, they, 
so uh, yeah, I would avoid putting too much time and thought into the timing questions because in my own experience, they're just crippling. <laughs> yeah. They don't, they don't let me move forward. They usually just lead to more questions and more uncertainty and lack of action. Yeah. Daryl. Yeah, I, I agree with, with what you say, Chris, I think, um, if you're if you're talking about wanting to move out of bonds into stocks, you have to say, well, why am I doing that? Well, you think stock is a better place to be. If that's what you think, then that means you think bonds are not a, such a good place to be. So why would you stay in them? All right. All right. Age, age 40 is where we start to see both target date funds and our own um, glide paths uh, bring in some bonds, though. So he may not want to go to zero. He, he might want to figure out, well, what's a reasonable amount to yeah. be starting ramping up as I'm, you know, going to be ramping towards retirement. So, yeah. And is it fair to say I've been thinking about next year a lot recently? that uh, this whole glide path discussion should be a major effort uh, in, in 2023 for us. Because uh, I find very few people, except people in target date funds, have an actual glide path in mind. I mean, the target date fund knows it for the next 50 years. In fact, the next 80 years, they've got it all figured out. But the individual investor typically does not have that figured out. And so then it becomes kind of dependent upon the direction of the market. And after the market goes down, people go, well, maybe it is time for me to get a little more conservative and add some bonds. So uh, I hope that we get a chance to, uh, to do some good work in that area next year. Uh, another question about... Uh, uh, two funds versus ten. I know, I, I know, Chris. You've addressed this in the past, but uh, this question comes up. They've read your book, Two Funds for Life. The book is just filled with with great information about how to build a portfolio with a combination of a target date fund and a small cap value. And then, of course, that's not one of the strategies that's represented in the table we just looked at. And one of the reasons it's not represented in that table is because it's not a static strategy. It is a strategy that changes with time. But, but how would you counsel somebody in this, this decision? 10 funds, and he's comfortable with 10 funds, he says, but versus the two fund strategy. Is he, he's asking about two funds for life specifically. Yeah. yeah. I, it, you know, this, this is probably one of my greatest personal frustrations in the work that we do at the foundation is that we haven't figured out a way for, uh, the two fund for life strategies and the, uh, the other sound investing portfolio strategies to, to be compared side by side. It's in an apples to apples way. Um, and it is because the cash flows matter. And so you need to have a lifetime allocation uh, combined with a lifetime cash flow set of assumptions to do the comparison. And, and those vary. It depends on where you are and what you're doing. And um, so I, I think, First of all, the book has a fair amount of information in it that might be helpful, especially uh, I was just looking at it. I think it's chapter nine. Um, hold on a sec. It's chapter 12, actually, uh, it does some of these comparisons so that that could be helpful. Uh, but it really comes down to some behavioral choices, too. Uh, do you want to have your glide path managed automatically or do you want to manage your own glide path? Do you want to control how much you have bond in bonds and equities yourself, or do you want to turn that over to a fund? And uh, you may want to think about legacy issues about whether you want to do it personally uh, and whether the person inheriting your accounts when you're gone wants to do it personally. There's this added complexity there. In general, you know, the longer your more equities, the higher your expected return and the higher your volatility and the more it's on you to behave well. <laughs> so there are people who are equities their whole life and they get 
uh, very good returns as long as they're disciplined in how they do it and they don't bail out of the market at the wrong times and panic sell and those kinds of things. But they have to have extraordinary behavior. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, it's, I, it's a tough question to answer with an apples to apples numbers analysis. But if we thought in terms of just the 10 funds versus the two funds without consideration for the fixed income, just a, a, assume that it really is about the, the, that you were going to use the same glide path in terms of fixed income. The implication of a portfolio that is early on so heavily concentrated in if you use the, the two funds for life where you take one and a half times your age or whatever that formula might be, uh, it's going to have a lot of small cap value early on in that, in, in, in that person's life as opposed to the two funds, the, the, the 10 funds, you're not going to have the heavy uh, concentration of small cap value uh, when you're younger. But by the time you're 40, you're going to have 40% of your portfolio, uh, well, more than 40% of your equity portfolio uh, in small cap value. So I would think just intuitively that you're going to get a better rate of return with the two fund strategy if you were using the same fixed income exposure up until maybe the last 10 years or maybe it's 20 years before retirement. I mean, there's some crossover point there where the amount of small cap value you have in the portfolio is not impacting the portfolio as, as, as much as it did earlier when you had a lot of small cap value. Well, the, the thing that's interesting uh, about that concentrated position in the early years is that you don't have much money. <laughs> so if you look at the lifetime dollar return, not not the compound rate of return per year, but you look at the lifetime impact on your spending power or your to total dollars, uh, you're absolutely right that your allocation nearing retirement and into retirement is far more important than your allocation in the early years. And so uh, to the extent that you can have a higher allocation to small cap value in those later years, it's going to have a bigger difference on your total long-term expected return, expected, not guaranteed, not promised, um, because the dollar amounts are so much bigger. But the two fund with the S&P 500 and small cap value is half in large, half in small, half in growth, half in value or blend um, and value. Uh, the same thing for the 10 fund. Uh, so those are both, since they're half in small and half in value, uh, they're, they do have a higher percent tilted that way than, say, a... Um, the most aggressive one in my two fund for life book where you have 30% of your portfolio in small cap value. Although that 30%, given that you're into a target date fund that uh, has a small equity position is probably, you know, comparable to the half and half again. So yeah, there, I would imagine in retirement, those aren't that different. And like I said, in, in my book, I actually run a number of those scenarios and you can compare them. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Okay, here from Steve. Uh, oh, this is, uh, I don't mean to pick on you here, Chris, but but th this one, Steve is complaining. <laughs> Went to M1 and they irritated him because he wasn't getting answers to whatever his complaint. I asked him for what the complaints were uh, and, I, and I have not received those complaints, but have you had complaints about M1? And if so, what are they typically about? I haven't had many complaints about M1, but I think it's fair to say that M1 Finance is an online brokerage that is going to be light touch in terms of customer support. There's no retail facility. There's no door you can walk in to get help. If you're not doing exactly what they have automated on their website, 
I would not be surprised if you ended up getting frustrated because there's they they have to run a lean, mean, automated machine. And uh, so I, I'm not surprised that somebody would have a frustrating experience there. Uh, what I will say is that for my own experience using them, which is all automated trades and automated maintenance of my Pi. Uh, I actually have two Pies there, I think. Um, it's been delightful, <laughs> you know, it just, it just runs. It just keeps on ticking and going in the background and I never interact with them. They never interact with me. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. And at the end of the year, I can get a tax statement, I, you know, it, it works. So I think as long as you're doing what they do, you know, what their mainstream usages are, you probably won't be too frustrated. But if you go beyond that, or if you're looking for uh, a lot of customer support, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised you get frustrated. Just, yeah, they can't afford to do that. And by the way, uh, I have heard some complaints about the transfer of retirement accounts there. I okay. can tell you, I can get complaints about almost every firm in the industry when it comes to the transfer of uh, IRA accounts. That is very, very difficult area. One, I think, is because uh, the, the companies that are moving this money around, they got to do the right thing, and they do. They cross every T and dot every I. They will not take a risk on top of the fact that a lot of the industry is having to hire people who aren't experienced and, and, and have had some real difficult times losing folks because there's other opportunities out there, evidently. Okay, uh, let's see. Russell here uh, uh, writes about AVLV. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk necessarily about Russell and a, AVLV uh at uh, avantis uh, by the way is it avantis or avantis i've heard a lot of people say avantis do you know chris or i don't know okay. uh, i All say right. avantis because uh i was trained in a european language and it looks like a european word okay. <laughs> and and i know their uh their uh cfo ceo is uh european too right eduardo so that's why i say it that way yeah all right. Well, here's the basic question. Uh, you are going to be looking at, at whether to replace particular ETFs. And if I'm not mistaken, AVLV is a large cap value ETF, correct? Yes. And the, 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 the fund that you have selected as the best in class ETF is RPV. RPV has had an amazing track record this year. Uh, and of course, what people are going to need to understand, if you decide to go with AVLV, it could even be that RPV had a better year in 2022 than AVLV, right? Sure. Yeah, it, I mean, it's, you're not. I don't choose funds based on recent performance or expected short-term performance. I choose funds based on uh, their expected long-term performance and exposure to the factors that our portfolios are built on, or the market attributes that our port portfolios are built on, of size and value, plus any bonuses I can get thrown in there at low cost. I want efficient funds that do all of that. Probably the most important thing that I try to tell everybody who asks a question like this, though, is that the differences are small. You know, I'm if I switched, if I switch, first of all, I hesitate to switch funds because I don't want to whipsaw people. Um, Excellent. So if I end up if I end up with a new fund that is just tiny fractionally better than the old fund, I probably won't change it. Um, and if I do change it, even though I've decided, okay, that difference is, you know, is significant enough that it warranted a change, um, these funds, in terms of their exposure, get more and more the same with every year because there's competition. And competition tends to weed out 
the the failures in the market it weeds out those that can't compete and it makes those that can compete more and more the same and so um, it's fantastic that dfa has brought out funds the dfa funds they're not actually that different from the avantis funds because the avantis funds were created by people that came from dfa right they they are different but um, it's not an earth shattering difference and it's not necessarily superior. So when people are asking these questions, I uh, usually tell them I'll be running the analysis again next year. I'll let you know what the answers are, but I wouldn't let it stop you from investing. Get going. All right, that's great. Thank you. And uh, Daryl, here's a good one for you. Small cap value had a great long-term return but more people are aware of them now and many index funds are built specifically with small cap value companies. What impact do you think the public awareness will have on the future of returns? And what can you add, give us about small cap value that should give us a sense? And this is kind of addressing another question in here uh, that we should continue to get the same kinds of better returns from small cap value versus the s p 500 for example wow i think this is my personal opinion based on what i've seen looking at the data and i think if you go back and you look at when when the small and value factors were discovered by uh back in the early 90s somewhere in the mid early 90s by fama and french and then you look at the the outperformance of small cap value versus total market since then, it has narrowed. So why is that? Um, I don't know why that is, but one could surmise that it's because it's it's becoming more exploited, maybe. Um, what was the second part of that question? Let me, let me, I want to follow up on that, though, Daryl. You have done a study that shows the telltale study that shows that the difference between the S&P 500 and small cap value has had 15 to 20 year periods. I think right. there have been three periods where small cap value was way behind the performance and then cracked back up. No, wasn't behind, it was even with. Well, no, what I mean is, no, it was behind. A, at one point and then came back up to being even in other words that for a 15 to 20 year period small cap value was performing at a at a lesser growth rate than the s p 500 and after maybe 15 or 16 17 years they're even they, they they've been they've been dueling it out for 17 years and finally you got the same return from both investments but there were periods back in the 20s, in the 30s, where small cap value way underperformed the S&P 500. And then of course, they will have these periods of amazing outperformance for relatively short periods of time. So I mean, does, are we going, we don't, we don't know whether we're going through one of those long periods of underperformance and then hopefully outperformance. In fact, what we know the last few years is small cap value has been doing better than the S&P 500. So maybe this is the start of something that will go on for a longer period of time. There we go. No, here's here's the relative performance chart. Yeah. And, and so, um, yeah, it's, it's typically been kind of, kind of bursty when things happen, it, they wait for a long time and then they kind of come in in great waves, if you will. Um, and then yes, from, about the, from about the mid 20 aughts, after the, the early 20 aughts, there was a large uh, burst in small cap value. And since then it's been, rel all things considered, relatively flat. This ends a couple of years ago, almost three years ago now, I guess. So. But um, and it has done better recently, but I'm not sure it's back up to even yet. Um, I'll have to I'll have to update these charts. So yeah, um, yeah. But, so but, but but if you go through and you look at the difference between the compound rates of return over the periods of time 
uh, since the mid '90s through now, it's actually a, a it's actually smaller than it was before. If you look at the the slope of the line from here to here, it's less steep than it is from uh, here to here. Okay, okay. So okay. it's not as it's not as dramatic as it has been. Whether that's because it's been discovered, I don't know. I am not a fundamental analyst. I don't have the the chops to do that. So so I don't know whether there's something in the fundamentals that says that um, the value premium is going away. But it um, looks it looks to me like from about 1920 of uh, 48 through about 1965, really. It just moved sideways, right? And the returns were virtually the the, the same, the same, right? And and, and so, so that's why it doesn't bother me. That's why it doesn't bother me over over longer periods of time to be in small cap value instead of the S and P five hundred. Because if you're a buy and hold longer term investor, you rarely it happens, but you rarely underperform over those periods of time. The S and P five hundred. So in fact, I think you had something on that in terms. I do, of I do, and I can't find it right oh, now. Okay, okay, no <laughs> problem, no problem. Um, let's talk about a question that came in. That says, "How do you think returns using your worldwide diversification will compare to a globally diversified?" total world ETF like Vanguard has. I mean, some people I think consider that to that representation because it has small cap in it. Not very much, but it does have small cap and it does have value. What do we have that 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 we could say would be a, a fair comparison of that? And it, if it's not obvious to you, I've got an idea, but what would you use uh, to compare that those numbers, yeah, I think that the gist the gist of it is he's comparing a total world market uh, to our ultimate buy and hold, right? And and the total world market fund is an, unless it's a tilted fund, one that one that tilts towards small in value, it's going to hold. Uh, it is going to have small and it's going to have large, but the small is going to be offset by the large and the growth is going to offset the value so that all you get is market return now that's not a bad thing market returns a good thing but um what we do in our portfolio is bring in exposure to small and exposure to value and that should have a higher expected return and a higher expected return per unit of risk yeah got it okay and what do you got here daryl so this is a no nonsense portfolio. It, this is it's kind of a tabular quilt chart, um, but it's over the last fifty years or so of of what we had for the no nonsense portfolios a while back, and um, so this is decadal performance, for example. And the total world is in here. It's right here. Oh yeah, so total world. And then there's the somewhere in here. There's a total U.S. Here's so, total U.S. So you yeah. can see that that they they don't they don't necessarily have the same return. Okay. Um, in the seventies, the the world market had a nine point eight, and the U.S. had a six point zero. In the eighties, the world market had a twenty, and the total U.S. was a total U.S. It had a sixteen point seven. In the nineties, the world market had an eleven, and the total U.S. had eighteen. Mm -hmm. So. And if you look at small cap value, is there a small cap value one in here? I don't remember. Hey, hey, look at the look at the the then the next the two thousand to two thousand nine. The total total market was a break even, and right. and the worldwide was one point one, made right one percent more. Right. And then in the next year, the total world or the next decade was about 12 and the total U.S. was 15. Yeah, this is so, great. By the way. We, we ought to have this uh, uh, up on our site and a link to it uh, 
for people to take. I think it's 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 very good because I get a lot of questions about is it really worthwhile having the the, the international. And uh, of course, when we look back at the 70s and we look at the 2000s, those two really bad decades uh, overall, his, at least historically, um, the, the broader diversification actually paid a premium. So in four of the five decades, the worldwide four fund Merriman portfolio, which is similar to the ultimate buy and hold, outperformed the total world market. Yeah, that's I, what I think I that's consistent say. with what we said before. Ah, yes. Yeah. Yes. It's only the last yeah, decade. If you wanted to do the do a worldwide portfolio, yeah. If you wanted to do a worldwide portfolio, buy the corners of the box. So I guess yes. that's not really the corners, but well, it's only the last decade, 2010 to 21, where the total world market outperformed the worldwide four fund. And the difference there was 11.7% for the total world market versus 10.9 for the worldwide four fund. But in the previous decades, um, the outperformance of the worldwide four fund was substantially more. Yeah. Yeah. And let me, so people who are listening to this, I can't see these numbers. In the 70s, the, the worldwide four fund was 13.9 and the total worldwide was 9.8. And then in the 80s, the worldwide four fund was 23% and the total uh, world was 20.3%. And in the 90s, the four, the worldwide four fund was 12.2, and the total worldwide was 11. And then in the 2000 through 2009, the total worldwide, the four fund worldwide was 7.2, and the total, where the total worldwide was 1.1. Uh, and then finally, the total, the four fund strategy uh, was 10.9 from 10 until 21. And for the total worldwide, it was 11.7. So uh, it only, it, am I right? It only had one period that, that. Uh, yeah, just that last uh, yeah. 10 year, the 10 years, 10, 2010 to 21. All right. Now, remember what the the worldwide four fund has has uh, twenty five percent U.S. large cap, twenty five percent U.S. small cap value, twenty five percent international uh, large value, and twenty five percent international small cap. And and the, I think the point to be made about that four fund strategy is what you're doing is you are exposing people to the same percentages of large blend, large value, small blend, small value, but you're doing it with different funds than you would with the all US for fund. But I mean, what the academics would say is that you're getting your small cap value, you're getting your small cap blend, whether it's from the US or international, uh, it, it, it's helping. All right, let me move along here. It says, uh, uh, why do you, Chris, why do you recommend different ETFs for taxable and tax deferred accounts? Tax efficiency. <laughs> hey, that's a good idea. Yeah, so, um, you know, some, uh, well, tax efficiency and also, uh, you know, related to tax efficiency, yields might be a secondary characteristic, but, uh, the, the biggest difference is in the funds, though, if you look at those portfolios, the overall portfolios, is that the uh, the tax, the taxable portfolios have different bonds in them. The tax deferred portfolios, uh, you don't, you know, the bonds can generate yields at normal, normal rates and uh, they can be taxable yields and it doesn't matter because they're in a tax deferred account. Uh, but if you look at the taxable portfolios, we use tax advantaged um, or tax uh, like municipal bond funds. 
um, in those to try and lower the tax burden in the taxable account. So I've got one more short topic for you guys because uh, we still get questions about helping people with their 401k. And a lot of folks who follow our work may not realize that we actually at one point had analyzed, I think it was a hundred or more than a hundred 401k plans for people. But that was when we had analyzed the recommendations based on trying to create the ultimate buy and hold for everybody, which of course, Chris, when he came to work with us said, we got to make this simpler for people. And, and, and then my famous meeting, famous for me, but uh, with John Vogel, where, where he, he chastises me for making things so complex. Uh, and so we've made it simpler. And, uh, and today, if we went back and we kind of started over and we're trying to figure out how can we help people with their 401k? Well, it might be they have small cap value in the S&P 500 and they could use that strategy. They may have all four funds of, of the uh, uh, US uh, only four fund strategy. And, and so I guess my question is, and I'm sure you guys have thought about this from time to time, is, uh, and Chris, I know you've done some work in this area about trying to figure out a way to give people some, some specific uh, recommendations, but in a general way, I guess, is what we'd be looking for, because we'd like to be able to give some sort of advice that could help everybody with their 401k next year. So what what are your thoughts, Chris? You've done it before, so what do you think? I I think that a lot of our listeners uh, would be able to come close on their own to figuring it out, and uh, many of them probably already feel comfortable. Uh, it comes down to what are the key attributes of the portfolio that you're you're trying to create, what are the attributes that matter most to you? And then how do you achieve them with what you got? You're cooking, right? You got a few ingredients here on the table and they're not the ones in the recipe. How do you, well, like what's the substitute for pepper? Um, so I think there's an intuition about it that's pretty good. Uh, if uh, you know, you're trying to, if your first priority is US international mix, uh, your first priority should probably be equities and bonds. And for young investors, it's going to be mostly equities, but for older investors, that's going to be your first fork in the road. Second fork in the road is probably going to be um, value versus total market, and then maybe size versus total market, and then U.S. versus international. And so you have to look at the ingredients you got and figure out how do you best approximate um, the the recipe that you that appeals to you the most and I, I you just said something that i hadn't really thought of and that's that we've given people more recipes and yeah. those recipes we know historically have had relatively similar performance so i think that enables people what i would really like to get to though when you and i talked about this on the phone the other day is um an evergreen piece that kind of captures some of these thoughts that we can let live on the website that can coach people through solving this problem for themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I think we should try and we, I've taken a cut at it three or four times and we haven't been happy enough with what I produced to put it up there yet. So hopefully next year we'll get there and get something Good. up. Good, that's great. And Daryl, your biggest challenge for next year? Out of curiosity, do you have anything hot on your plate? I'm sure I do. You, you, you never fail to make sure that I do. So, <laughs> I'm sorry. I should. I'm, I'm just not sure what they are right now. Okay. Um, okay. I know we're going to do the, do the ultimate buy and hold in the beginning of the year, but, but uh, uh, beyond that, I'm not quite sure. Let me check my board here. But you know something, we, what we know we do the first part of the year is update those tables that people right. depend on us for, the fine tuning, the distributions, the, uh, all of those. And, uh, uh, and that, that, by the way, that work is so valuable. I, I spoke to 144 uh, engineering students at Rutgers, Rutgers last night 
Mm. And, uh, and they've asked each one of those students to uh, share what they learned. What was the, the big takeaway from the presentation? And uh, I hope the big takeaway take is the people at Merriman have a lot of tables. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, I really appreciate you guys. You're so much help to the people that follow our work and, uh, and you create so much of the real blood and guts of what they need to know. So thank you both. And uh, as always, we'll uh, see you next month uh, for a Q&A. Uh, and uh, and and we have a uh, we have a couple of other things coming out shortly that we have uh, recorded. So we got some, I think, some good lessons coming up here for the last part of the year. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And uh, and I'll give you thanks now for all the people you're going to suggest come uh, check out our work. We appreciate it when you spread the word. Thanks very much. It's Paul Merriman with Sound Investing. Sound Investing, soundinvesting.com and paulmerriman.com are produced and exclusively owned by Paul Merriman, who is solely responsible for their content. For more information, free articles, mutual fund recommendations, and more, visit paulmerriman.com.